Thank you so much, Lisa. That is very kind of you to say. After all of your hard, incredible work, uh, Lisa is really behind this festival and has done so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, Deb and Ricky, thanks for your presentation. Really beautiful stuff. Gave me so much to think about. Thank you very much. The Dickinson Memorial Library is very pleased to present the next speaker of the festival, Dr. Joan Maloof, who is the founder of the Old Growth Forest Network, which is a national network of protected native old growth forests. Dr. Maloof has worked with plants her entire life and is a renowned conservationist, ecologist, and writer. Her formal education includes a BS in plant science, an MS in environmental science, and a doctorate in ecology. Her books include Teaching the Trees, Among the Ancients, Nature's Temples, and The Living Forest. Today, Dr. Maloof will talk about her body of published works and how each book grew out of a need to communicate a different aspect of the forest's importance. If you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to type them in the Q&A. And Dr. Maloof will address the questions at the end of her presentation. Dr. Maloof, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor is thank yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And get my presentation. There we are. Um, just love the cover of Honoring Nature. So I wanted to use it here. It's so beautiful. Thank you for um, putting that work together. So on this um, talk, this wonderful authors and artists festival, I also added an activist because I'm going to share how I went from being an author to being an activist. So the first part, we'll talk about my books and the last part, the passion and the heart in the activism. My start was as a scientist and here I am working on my master's degree and then my PhD and these are the sort of places where I would publish my work and um, you know at that time they were on the library shelves and not many people would get to read them and the statistical analysis but even though I was an ecologist and cared very much about nature and published about nature this is what I saw happening around me, wherever I went. These mature forests were being cut down. And of course, it does not take a PhD scientist to know that this is not helpful to the environment and the creatures. And we would, I would, mourn about the box turtles that were being crushed and their homes taken away and the neotropical migrants that would come back to nest and their forest was gone. And we know sometimes they come back for 10 to 15 years to practically the same tree. So it's not like just anywhere will do for these birds. If they come back and their forest is gone, they have to go find another place where there's likely competition from other birds. So there's the creatures that we know about, but then there are also the tiny little creatures that we know we don't know about, right? And these are some creatures that are only found in old growth forests. You know, these are not household names and likely we're not going to see these when we walk through the forest. So we have to depend on the people that study these little tiny things to tell us that yes, they exist and that their homes are also destroyed in this logging. And we know we're losing biodiversity. You know, this is the largest crisis to me on the planet because once we lose these organisms, well, we've never seen whether humans have the ability to turn that back. Can we have this curve go the other way? Um, of course, extinct things will never come back, but even, even as the populations decline, can we bring those populations back? We've seen that in a very few cases, like the sandhill cranes, once we start paying attention, but most cases, things get rarer and rarer and rarer. 
So that's setting the stage of how I first became an author because I realized that my work as a scientist wasn't telling the story that I wanted to tell and wasn't making the difference that I wanted to make. So I thought, what if I take those scientific papers that the other ecologists have written that talk about these losses and bring this research out into a general readership? And at first it was just essays that I was writing, trying to convince the foresters that what they were doing wasn't good. But eventually that turned into a book. I realized I'm writing a book and um, didn't have any experience at all with writing a book for a general audience. And I was very fortunate that I went to a conference um, International Study of Literature and the Environment, IELTS, and I met someone from a press there and I said, how does this work? This was University of Georgia Press, I said, I think I'm writing a book. How does this work? And she said, here's my card, just send me um, a chapter when you think you're ready. And so I waited until I was finished the whole book and then emailed her and sent her a chapter and she said, I love it, send me the rest of it. And I did, and she said, we wanna publish it. So it seemed so fast from this manuscript of essays into a published book. And in this book, I talked about things like the little organisms that depended on these trees, like the sycamore lace bug, this this is magnified, but it's absolutely beautiful. And I know it can be a problem with crops. We were just talking about farming the lace bugs, but the lace bugs are so specific. This particular lace bug only lives on sycamore trees. So if you cut down a forest that has sycamore trees and no more sycamore trees return or are planted, which is the common thing, you will have no more sycamore lace bug or the other eight insects that depend entirely on sycamore trees, including some amazing little insects that actually migrate and they have to just catch the wind going in the right direction at each season because they're not strong enough to fly against the wind. So these little, these stories of these creatures and plants also such as beech drops, which are a plant, but they're non photosynthetic and they depend entirely on beech trees. So if you have no beech trees, you are going to have no beech drops. And in fact, the beech trees are discouraged by loggers because the timber is not worth much on the market. So if you have a beech forest, in Maryland, this is where I'm speaking to you from today, they will recommend that you cut the beech trees down and plant pine trees instead and spray herbicide to kill any beech trees that come up. So there, I've actually heard foresters call beech trees a plague without realizing that when you lose them, you lose the creatures that depend on them. And not just beach drops either, right? All kinds of creatures, even bears depend on the nuts from beach trees. Or little organisms like the holly leaf miner. This is just a tiny little fly, but if there's no American holly trees, there are no holly leaf miner flies that lay their eggs between the upper and lower surface of the holly leaf. And when the egg hatches out, it's this tiny yellow larvae that eats the cells between the two layers of leaves. So you can see it's tiny here and it gets larger and larger as it feeds and it will eventually pupate when it gets large enough and break out and 
become this fly that's looking for its own mates and its own holly leaves. And there's another layer too, right? The parasitic wasp that lays its eggs only in these holly leaf miner larvae. So there's layer upon layer upon layer in these native forests that when we dumb them down by cutting them and converting them to whatever is the most popular wood fiber of the month at the market, that there we're losing biodiversity and also beauty. I'll talk about that too. So in that first book, there was also a chapter called Old Growth Air, where I visited an old growth forest and discussed the health benefits of breathing forest air. You walk into these old forests and you just can feel different. And it's not your imagination, right? Your um, blood pressure changes it's reduced, your blood sugar changes, it's reduced, your stress chemicals are reduced, your immune chemicals cells are increased. So the air in these forests is something we haven't talked much about, but it's very important. And after teaching the trees, was released, the number one question I got about that book was not about the holly leaf miners or, or the beach drops. It was, how do I get to that forest? How do I find that forest? And I realized that there was this desire in people to want to see these places, these untouched forests, especially in the East, right? We all know that we can get in a plane where we could have before, before 2020 and go to California and go to Muir Woods and see the beautiful growth forest. But where do we find an untouched forest in Massachusetts, an old growth forest? Where do we find one in Maryland? Where do we find one in Connecticut? These exist, tiny little bits of them, but they're hard to find. So I decided that I would write a second book and it would tell people, explain to people how to get to an old growth forest in each of the 26 Eastern states. So everything East of the Mississippi. And that book was Among the Ancients. <laughs> and the book also discusses the, how to recognize the um, differences between the old growth forests in the West and the old growth forests in the East, right? So often we imagine that the old growth forests are going to look like this Western old growth forest with the redwoods and the sequoias and the Eastern old growth forest look nothing like that, right? This is definitely Eastern old growth. This tree I'm hugging here is 326 years old. It's been cored. This forest has been undisturbed, but most of us wouldn't recognize that that is old growth. And so we can take these forests for granted unless we're educated on what to look for. Okay, for some reason. Okay. So this is the map that I literally was putting stickies on where I was going to visit in each state after I, I did my research on these forests. And I did get to see some beautiful places and the book tells you exactly how to get to these places, such as this um, Sipsy Wilderness in Alabama and this is a tulip poplar tree, which most people wouldn't even recognize it as that because the tulip poplar bark changes so much when it gets very old. But also the downed trees, which are a very important part of the old growth ecosystem. And this is in the Smoky Mountains where 
in the original forest, the American chestnuts were not cut out. And this is an American chestnut that is still on the ground habitat to many creatures and releasing its nutrients back into the soil, into the living trees. And the standing snags that are so important ecologically. And when we had these big old forests, the cavities in these dead snags were large enough that bears could hibernate in them. And nowadays it's very, very rare to find a tree that's large enough that a bear could hibernate in its base. Now the bears are hibernating in caves and they're not in as many places as they used to be. Parts. And in that book, Among the Ancients, I also talk about the history of our forest. So in 1620, there were many native people living on this continent and they had cleared out forest for their villages, for crops, but at least half of the forest was untouched old growth is what the estimates are. So this black shows all that area where that forest can grow. And um, the white areas would be such as prairies and deserts where forests cannot be supported. But by 1850, with the European settlers, we were just cutting like crazy and exporting the timber. The timber had now become a commodity. People are buying and selling, which it wasn't in the days of the native people. And <clears throat> notice how the Western forests were not being cut as much. And that's because the um, Western expansion hadn't really reached that area. But by 1920, even the Western forests were being cut. The um, sequoia trees were being cut down. 95% uh, of the redwood trees were being cut down. To today, we have 1% left of that original forest in the east and 5% in the west. I pause there because, um, you know, it's just an amazing statistic to me that our forests just kept disappearing and continue to disappear. And that's, and that's information is what led me really to, to my activism, which I'll discuss at the end. So of course, um, let me find my little pointer here. So the story that I just told you was a continent, let's say that in New England, that was 90%, 95% percent, forested. And then that cutting continued, continued, continued till about 1850, 1900 is when we hit the depth of our deforestation. And that had to be so hurtful to a sensitive heart because these are the original old forests that are being cut. And since that time, in our time, the forests have recovered. So I would say the forest cover has recovered, not the forest. These areas that were bare now have trees on them up to 60% of the landscape, even some places 80% of the landscape, such as in Maine. But those forests here are really nothing like the forests on the other side of that curve, because these are second growth forests. And we're losing them again, mostly to development. But another thing is happening too, in that these second growth forests are getting older now, let's say 80 years old, 100 years old. And so now they're being cut again. And so now we have second and third growth forests. So we're keeping our forests very young, even though we have more cover, that cover is of a younger forest. And I kept hearing from the forest industry that forests need to be managed to be healthy. 
you know, you pick up all these you know, brochures, or you look at these websites from American Forest Foundation, or you know, the, for all these organizations were promoting management of the private forest and the public forest, the state forest and the national forest, saying that it was healthy for the forest. So as an ecologist, I'm thinking, I don't think so. <laughs> but I wasn't hearing any voices contrary to that, really. So I took that on as a project to try to answer that question. Are these managed forests really healthier or not? And so by diving into the scientific literature and finding any scientific study that compared an old growth forest or older original forest to a forest that had been managed, let's say cut on a schedule or thinned out. What did that ecologist find, no matter what they study? And I have various chapters that describe various organisms. So for instance, the amphibian chapter in an old growth forest that's left alone, you'll have many more salamanders number-wise, these, these numbers represent redback salamanders, then the second growth forests that are being cut and managed. And you also have more variety of salamander species. So when you look at salamanders, is it healthy to manage the forest? And the answer is no, it's healthier just to leave the forest alone. And we find the same thing if we're looking at wildflowers and the diversity of wildflowers. Some wildflower diversity has never recovered in hundreds of years after original cutting. Bird species, some birds like younger forests, but some birds like much older forests. And the birds that like the older forests are declining. So we need to provide habitat for them. So the management, the cutting and thinning is not good for those birds that need the older forests. And one of the reasons that they need the older forests is they need the cavities that form in the trees in the old forest because not all birds build nests. A lot of them live in cavities. Also, the older forests with its larger trunks and more bark area is better feeding ground to get the insects for these birds that are mostly feeding their young ones insects, not berries and nuts. What about fungi, right? We love mushrooms, we love fungi, and the most diversity of fungi is gonna be in a forest that's entirely left alone, not in one that's managed. So I hope some of our participants have um, been learning about the mycorrhiza connection, the fungi connected to the tree roots and the way that the trees can share materials with each other through this fungal network. So this diagram here is taken from a paper from Suzanne Samard's lab up in British Columbia. The dark circles are the larger, older Douglas fir trees, medium green, medium sized trees, light green, the smaller Douglas fir trees. The black lines show the fungal connections between the trees. The oldest trees have the most fungal connections. And they're in fact, moving some materials to the younger trees to help them out if those younger trees are in the shade and they can't photosynthesize as much. So in the old days, you know, 20 years ago, we used to think, oh, you could walk into this forest and you could say, oh, I'm going to cut down this tree here and think it wouldn't have an effect on the other trees. Or if it did, it would be a positive effect. But what we now know is that when you remove even that one tree, you're affecting this whole network underground. 
And um, we're just learning that now, right? Imagine what we're gonna know 50 years from now. But meanwhile, these forests are coming down. So the summary of that book was that um, in the older unmatted forest, you have more of all these things and some of these things that can only live in these places. So with that, I was able to say as a scientist that the healthiest forest is the one that is left alone and unmanaged. Yes. And this was really, I knew when I was working on it that it was not going to be a bestseller. You know, I was going to read all these details. I tried to make them move along and enjoyable, but still it's the scientific details that you need to make the argument. But it was important to me to provide this for all these groups across the country that are trying to save forests that don't necessarily have the time or resources to delve into the scientific research. And there's the biodiversity and there's the numbers, but then there's the beauty too, because in those visits to the old growth forests, as a scientist, I kept thinking, I'm going to discover some amazing patterns. What am I going to discover? Right? Those of us in school, if we learned the scientific method, it was like observation was number one. So what am I going to observe? Well, what I kept observing was that these forests were so beautiful, so beautiful. And I even did a study on this that talked about the beauty of the forest and how the older forests are more beautiful. And so that kind of segued into another book, the coffee table book, where I was invited by um, a wonderful Virginia photographer, Robert Llewellyn, to put words to his beautiful images. And just a little eye candy here for you. And these are the beautiful beings that get destroyed when these logging trucks come in. And to wrap up the book part, this, this is my newest book, and this will um, come up for pre-sale in April, and it will be published this summer. And this is uh, Princeton University Press approached me and said, we have this little book called Fungipedia, and it's really popular. People love, it's kind of back to the little mini encyclopedia, and we'd like you to do a treepedia. And I thought, yeah, I can do that. That'll be that'll be fun and interesting. And they asked me to do it before the COVID pandemic started, and it was the perfect thing to work on while I was trapped in my house and couldn't do all the journeying that I normally do to the forest. So this will be, I joke that the last one was a coffee table book, and this one's the bathroom book. So look forward to um sharing something lighter, something more fun. And that's it with the books. And now um, I'd like to talk about the activism because the folks before me, the farmers before me, we were, they were, there was a discussion about the passion and about the heart. So once I really learned and felt what was happening with the forest, I knew that I needed to do more than just write about it, that I needed to act. But what can you do, right? It's a huge, huge problem, uh, opportunity. How can we save these old forests from being cut down? How can we save even the second growth forest, some of them anyway, from being cut down yet again. Right? I believe in using wood as a resource, but just not all the forests. And it seemed to me 
that every forest was up for grabs, unless it was in a national park. I mean, even state parks aren't really protected. And at the same time that we protect these forests, we also need to be connecting the next generation with them. Because we're not going to be here that much longer, you know, give us a couple more decades if we're lucky. And so even if we're able to protect these forests, we need a next generation. And how are, why are they going to want to protect the forest? They're only going to want to protect the forest if they have a heart relationship with it too. So we have to do both things. We have to protect the forest and we have to build a relationship with the forest into the next generation. And that's when the idea came to me. I think I channeled it. I was just came all of a piece that it's not enough just to have these wild lands and these parks that are far from the children. We need to have one forest in each county that is protected from logging and open to the public. So they can develop a relationship with these forests, watch the forests age over time, build a relationship with the biodiversity there. And that idea was like, yes, you know, one in each county. So I went home, I was, I got the idea when I was on one of my old growth trips, I went home and Googled counties in the US and saw this map. It's like, oh, that's a big job. Not all forests can, not all counties can support forest growth. Uh, the numbers are up top there, about two thirds can. The colors on the map uh, represent the different forest types. This was a job that I could not do alone, of course, too big for me. So I formed a 501c3 organization, the Old Growth Forest Network, with the idea that in time, if each of these counties had a special old forest that was protected and open, that we could go anywhere. We could move, we could travel across the country, and we could find out where these special up forests are and visit them. And I eventually um, retired early from my tenure track teaching position to follow this passion project of creating the Old Growth Forest Network. And it was in 2012 that I really got going with, on it full time. And currently we have 118 forests in 24 states. And this is an image of our website, Old Growth Forest. Dot net. So if you want to know where any of those forests are and how, exactly how to get there and exactly what the forest is like, you can go on the website and see. And we are growing, right? We have now 4,000 people that say, yes, we believe in the mission of the Old Growth Forest Network. We have volunteers in hundreds of counties that are looking for the best forest in their county and helping us to connect with the management of those forests to make sure they're protected and get them in the old growth forest network. So we have um, many listeners on this and I know we're all different places so I welcome people if you want to volunteer and be a county coordinator you can sign up on the website under get involved and we also are supported completely on donations from small family foundations and individuals and it's so heartwarming to see how people have responded and believed in this project and supported the project. Here's one of our dedications. So once we identify a forest in a county that is going to be in the old growth forest network and it's firmly protected, we have a dedication celebration. And this is one of our larger <laughs> dedication celebrations, of course, pre-COVID um, in Ohio. But to me, it's the image that says we need to stick together, we need to do this together. It's a big job. And it's really bigger than even just creating the network. 
because it's intergenerational. We have to keep it going for a long time. I don't expect the whole network to be built out in my lifetime, but I'm just honored to be able to get it started and watch it grow while I am here. And thinking about time, I'm looking at the time, <laughs> how much time do I have? But with the forests, right, the time scale is so different from Mars that we need to adjust to that. So this is one of, I was taking a forest walk and I saw this beautiful four generation group, this little baby and his mother and his mother's mother and his mother's mother's mother and her mother probably gone. But these generations here, these 13 generations back is when that little seedling germinated that became that 326 year old tree that I had my arms around that I was hugging in the Eastern old growth. So they may not look that massive, but it takes many generations of protection, con continuous protection to protect these forests. And they can be taken down so quickly, just in a day. And they are when the wrong people are in charge and the wrong people are making decisions. So we need to, to stick together. Um, to do our part in our generation for these forests. And beyond creating the network, um, we help people to save forests in their community by giving them ideas, connecting them with other people. And that is the end of my talk where I went from being this, um, master's degree student doing my statistical analysis and numbers in the field to being an activist to preserve these forests and getting much, much joy from that. So I invite you to join me and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you like me to read the Q&A question? Um, I think I can do that. Um, okay, I'll read, um, I'll read down there. Which of Joan's books speak most to the symbiosis of the insect plants and trees, et cetera, that she is talking about? Um, symbiosis, I would say, would be Teaching the Trees, my first book. Should I click the answer live after I do that or just keep moving? <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll just delete it. Oh, okay. So it'll go okay. Away. Yeah. So the symbiosis is nature's temples. I mean, teaching the trees, but nature's temples is the one that looks at each of these categories. So for instance, insects, you know, which insects do better in the older forest versus the younger forest. So the next question. Um, any others? What, if any amount of forests are being allowed to grow old in the East since 2000? Well, since 2000, that's really a hard one. I don't have the answer to that. There are some forests that are being allowed to get older. And primarily I think of Adirondack State Park in New York. That was pre-2000, though, where they, they put in their state constitution, they created the forest preserve that won't be cut. So those trees are getting older and older. Mm, there's not really any systematic record that exists of where exactly the old growth forests are left and what is happening to them. In fact, I'm going to be involved in a mapping conference in the spring where we are people from many different groups and talents are gonna put our heads together and try to figure out where these old 
forests are specifically that are left. So the ones that I found for my book are open to the public, but there are older forests on private lands that we don't really know about. So there could be people that own forests themselves that are letting them go old, get older since 2000, but we don't really know about them because there's not a central <laughs> record keeping place for that. And also those forests that are privately owned that people aren't cutting, it would be nice to know about them and it would be nice to get stronger preservation on them, such as a forever wild easement, because you know we're humans, we tend to think we're gonna live forever and oh, we're protecting this forest and I'm not gonna let anything happen to that forest. Well, all of a sudden you get the bad news, you know, you have pancreatic cancer or something and you're gone and that forest goes to somebody else and they don't have the same connection and they sell it and the next thing you know, the forest is coming down. So these are the types of, this is the type of work we do too, in addition to um, just building the network. Uh, which forest actively sequesters more carbon, old growth or younger growing forest? And thank you for asking that, Christine. And it is definitely the old growth forest. And this is other new information. So 20 years ago, people thought it was the younger forest because they thought, oh, you cut down these old trees that aren't doing much. They're just sitting there and they're putting down limbs and some of those limbs are rotting. But meanwhile, if you cut down that forest and the little young trees come up, you can, you can see, practically see them growing. You can feel them pulling carbon from the air. But it's sort of a magic trick because those younger growing trees are doing most of their work at eye level, so we see that, but the older forests, the growth is happening in the canopy where we're not as aware of it. And also, these older trees tend to have a larger diameter, so even if their rings are very narrow, they're putting on new growth in a very narrow ring, Think of that narrow ring covering the diameter of this larger tree, right? If you do the math, a narrow ring with a larger diameter tree could end up being much more volume, much more mass than a wide ring on a very small tree. So you have just literally the size of the trees and not just the trunk too, all the branches and all the leaves in the older trees are all holding the carbon. So these forests are sequestering more carbon. But also what's happening underground, right? Because these big old trees have larger root systems that are storing carbon underground and they are moving carbon from those roots via the mycorrhizae <laughs> across the whole forest. So 40% of the carbon that is taken in through the leaves from the air is going in the ground. And the soil is increasing in its carbon content. So if you go to our webpage, oldgrowthforest.net. And if you go to resources, we've actually created a fact sheet about this that describes how the older forests sequester more carbon. So thank you for asking that. Um, okay, Don says, the people need to become aware of the critical relationship between forests and forest soils and the climate crisis. The trees need to be left undisturbed to capture CO2 emissions. Do you think all public forests in both our nation and the states should be off limits to commercial logging? Don, yes, <laughs> I do. Um, this is another place, right, where we've, we've learned more, we know more than we did 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Our, National forests 
instead of being cut for the 4% wood fiber that they provide to our country, should be national carbon banks. They should be allowed to get older to store the wood, not only in the branches we just talked about, but underground in the soil. Also biodiversity banks, right? If we don't cut those forests for fiber, the fiber is gonna become more biodiverse. So with the new administration, I actually got inspired and wrote a bill that would do just this. It would um, stop logging of the national forests, at least temporarily, and making them a carbon bank and biodiversity bank. But this is where we also have to be realistic, right? I can't do everything. None of us can do everything. And considering my background, that I'm an academic and a writer and an activist, I don't really have the wherewithal, I don't have the political capital, I'll put it that way, to make this happen. So I'm hoping that other people will take this up as their cause. And I can be just one of the people on their bandwagon and share this information with them. And the same is with the public forests in our state forests. Um, I would also like to see them limit the commercial logging. I'm in Maryland and our, we have no national forest here. So the only thing we have to deal with really is our state forest. And the state forests are logged using FSC certified methods, which people think, oh, well, that's good. But it is not good. These forests are looked at as just a source of fiber. And I go out to ground truth these forests, these harvest plants, and I see big old trees and I see birds and I see wetlands and I see things like the beech trees and, and things like the dogwoods and the American holly and these rare tree species that the foresters are not going to manage for. And so I write comments and I share those comments with the Maryland supporters of the Old Growth Forest Network and ask them to write comments, but it's not doing enough. I think we need a revolution in the forestry schools and in our governments. So I welcome everyone to participate in that revolution for the forest. Okay. A couple panelists had their mm -hmm. hand raised. I oh, think okay. Karen was first. Karen, do you want to go ahead? And then Roger. Okay. Um, hi, Joan. Hi. You, I, um, I have your book, The Old Growth Forest, or Among the Ancients. Uh -huh. And I live near Rhode Island. So I took a trip the other day to the Oakland Forest. Mm -hmm. And it's so small. And so my question is, how many acres, what actually constitutes a forest? How does something become labeled that? And what was your reaction, if you can remember, when you saw that particular forest? It's beautiful, but it's so tiny. Yes, yes, exactly right. Um, so the definition of what is a forest is kind of all over the place. Uh, one of the official definitions is, you know, 10 acres, that's at least 10% for, forest cover. Um, so um, doesn't sound very exciting. The, the smallest forest that we've considered for the old growth forest network is only 14 acres, but it's a true old growth forest. So we don't have any cut and dried limits. We're always looking for the largest, oldest forest we can. And of course, the larger the forest, the more species you're gonna find there automatically. Uh, there's a linear relationship in conservation biology. The bigger, the more species. So even when, like we're talking about the state forests, even when they say, oh, we're only going to take half. Well, if you take half that forest, you're reducing the number of species that can live there. So the Oakland Forest in Rhode Island, I was looking for an old growth forest to visit. 
right, in Rhode Island. So I'm doing all the states in the East. And this is the only one that came up for me in the search. So I thought, okay, that's the one I'll go to. And I went there. And like you, I was a little bit underwhelmed. I'll put it that way. I, you know, you park in a neighborhood and it just looks like, you know, kind of a wood lot. It doesn't look like, oh, you know, we expect these old growth forests. You can, you walk through it and you can see in the winter into people's backyards. <laughs> so it's not large and it doesn't support all the species that originally were supported in the Rhode Island forest, but you know what? It's the best we've got, sadly. And even that forest was supposed to be cut down, right? You read the story in the book. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. it was that was purchased by a developer that was gonna cut down the forest and it happens all the time and it's perfectly legal. And it was just the person that they brought in to survey it and tell them how they were gonna take the forest down, Matt Largess, who said this forest shouldn't be cut because it's one of the last older forests left in Rhode Island. And he connected with a land conservancy that then raised the funds to purchase that area, a lot of money. So even though I was not impressed and it's not great, it's the best we have left there. And yeah, and I think the other, I'm sorry, the other interesting thing in that chapter was how you explained how Maryland um, taxes property when it's sold and takes a tiny percentage to help protect forests do, or, or you know property. Do you know if that's happening in many other states? I don't know. I think it's been pretty progressive for Maryland to have that. So the idea for people listening, anytime property changes hands, there's that transfer tax. Well, as property gets more and more expensive, it's hard for states to buy conservation property because it's more expensive, but the transfer tax also goes up with the price of the property. So if you just take a percentage of that, you can always afford some public property. So in Maryland, this is called program open space. I don't know of any other states that have that. I'm not, maybe they do, I don't know, but um, program open space was under threat this year because it's accumulated so much, so much money. And, um, you know, they were gonna move some money into the general fund, but I think it's been saved. Unfortunately, from my point of view, a lot of the program open space money is used for playground equipment or fences or lighting, um, hard structures, parking lots even, ball fields, instead of just on land. I would prefer to see it more preserving land. Okay, thanks. Hey, Roger, do you wanna ask your question? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Joan. Um, it's not so much a question. Well, it's it's a, a comment which might sort of ramble inelegantly into a question. But um, thank you very much for what you said about about management. Um, some years ago, I was for, for complicated reasons on a woodland management course, and there was a lot of talk about cutting down trees in order to allow the others to breathe. And I was reminded of sort of the poet John John Donne, who said, or who, who nearly said, "No tree is an island entire unto itself." And that's what you just reminded us about the the connection between things. And I left the course thinking, well, I think these you know these trees can actually manage themselves. Really, they don't they don't really need that human intervention. <clears throat> but I was listening to you talking about your path, your journey from being an academic to an activist and thought, well, you've left out something. It was your journey towards being a creative po poet mm -hmm. as well, because you responded when you were talking about trees, you were responding in a very creative, poetic way. And also those pictures you showed of you with trees, you were, you were responding to the trees, you, were, you were, had a relationship with the trees that was sensual, sensuous even, tactile, 
Um, and you did indeed talk about relationships, building up relationships with, with you know, with, with, with the trees. So I'm, I was wondering about, you <clears throat> briefly touched on the new administration, um, and this is where the question may come in, um, about how you feel about working now with an, with an administration which at the moment seems like it can respond um, on a human level, on an artistic poetic level, but also on a practical level um, and how that um, bodes well for, um, for the continuation of your project. Yeah, uh, thank you, Roger. So you're very astute. Um, I did have a poetic sensibility, <laughs> even during those years as a scientist. And I, in fact, wrote a lot of poetry, didn't publish a lot, published a little bit, but um, that did help when it came time to start mm -hmm. writing about the, the emotion that the forest brought up um, and the connections in my first book, Teaching the Trees. And, I've, and I included a lot of poetry in that book, including Rilke, and I published the entire ninth elegy in the back of the book. So I did have that poetic piece. And I also, truth be told, had an activism piece too. But my activism had mostly been focused on Cold War and you know, wars in general, peace activism. And then eventually shifted over into activism for nature. And as far as the administration, it's very exciting. Um, I feel like, yes, they are poised to make differences just like that. But I also, as I was expressing before, I would love for somebody else to open those doors for me and walk through them holding my hand. You know, I'm happy to go through them, but you know, how do I get an appointment? How do I get into somebody's office? How do I really get this started? I'm just so afraid it will distract me from all the things that I'm doing right now, which are myriad. <laughs> and um, so I I do a lot of things myself, but I'm learning to rely on other people too. So we're a community, just like the forest, right? We're all connected. We depend on each other. Thank you, Roger. So I'm going to try and uh, just squeeze in one more question from the Q&A. Um, she, she asks, can you determine a tree's age without coring it? Mm -hmm. The answer is, if you want an exact age, coring it is the only way we know how, unless you know when that tree was planted, <laughs> if it's in a lawn or something. But um, I have developed skills that will let me put a tree in a general ballpark. And it takes a while to learn these skills. And it's helpful to have somebody else go with you. So my answer is yes, I can. And tree people, we love to make a wild guess. What do you think? Well, 140. No, 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 it's got at least 160. And the ways that I tell are not so much with the diameter of the tree, because you can have trees that'll grow very fast and be very wide, or you'll have trees that'll be um, competing in a forest and, and have a narrow diameter. There's two things that give, give away the age of the tree for me. Number one is the canopy structure, that if you've drawn these trees in third grade as these Vs that come out with all these branches with this beautiful typical tree shape, that's gonna be a young tree if you see something like that. But if you look up there and you see a couple of gnarly old branches and they have things sticking off at strange angles and they kind of look like animal antlers in a way, that's an old tree. And the reason they look like that is because they have been in that spot for centuries while the forest changes around them. So it's going to be shady over here. Now it's going to be sunny over here. Now there's going to be a storm and this one's going to fall down. So the result is these very oddly shaped branches. So that's my number one giveaway. Number two is the bark. The bark on a tree changes with age. 
and different tree species change in different ways. So for instance, that tulip poplar tree I showed, um, tulip poplar tree, when it's very young, will have bark that's not very rough. As it gets older, it gets rougher and rougher and rougher, meaning deeper bark crevices. But then it gets to a point when it gets very old that it will start getting smooth again. And that we call that balding. And so if I look at a tree, even if it's not very wide and I see this strange canopy shape and I see this balding, I will say, oh, for sure that tree is over hundred years old. So you can learn these things, but they take a while. I'm not sure there's time for another question. Um, yeah. We just have a couple minutes. Would you like to close? Um, so I want to thank you for putting on this festival. I think it's so great to get everybody together just to share our hearts and to encourage each other that um, every little thing we do is important. So people might look at what I do and say, oh, it's this giant project and she's writing all these books. But I've also shared with you today what I can't do. You know, None of us can do this ourselves. So we need to stick together as a community. And that's what I often say about the Old Growth Forest Network. We're not just a network of forests. We're also a network of people who care about forests. So I welcome anyone to join us on that mission and we'll keep each other informed. It's amazing that this is the first national organization that's focused on saving our older forests. So um, we can do it. Thanks everybody. Thank Bye. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.